Let me sort it. Um, okay, so why don't we get started? So, uh, hi everybody, um, welcome to the this week's physics colloquium. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Chris Stoughton to give this week's uh, colloquium. Uh, he's a multifaceted experimentalist uh, who's at Fermilab. Uh, he did his PhD at Columbia, and uh, since then he's been working on a huge variety of subjects from the hadro production of the charm uh, to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, survey the Dark Energy Survey, CMB Stage 4 experiment, and um, most important for this talk, the Fermilab G-2 muon experiment, which he'll tell us about, and which has been in the news quite a bit recently. Uh, he's also recently moved into quantum computing applications, um, so we're very grateful that you could join us and tell us about these important new results. Um, so please join me in welcoming Chris. Uh, Chris, take it away. It's all yours. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me to Toronto. I wish I could visit that fine city again. And I hope I will in the near future. Uh, this, of course, is the iconic picture of Fermilab. So if you ever go there, make sure you go out there and check out the buffalo. This was this year's prop. One of the, this is one of the first calves. And uh, just for perspective, I'll be showing more pictures of the lab later. This is the famous high rise building. I'll show you a picture. This is sort of looking out the front of it. And we'll look out the backyard to see our experiment later. So that's the general orientation and welcome to Fermilab. Um, this is the experiment. Uh, the G minus two experiment looks like this. And instead of so many, uh, experiment where you see a little drawing of a person. We have an actual person standing in the middle to give you an idea of what the scale is. This is a typical raised platform computer floor here, electronics rack. Um, and this big blue thing is the storage ring that we store the muons in while we make the measurement. And the upper left-hand corner is the lead in of where the muons come in from. So that gives you a basic orientation of, of where you're standing. Um, the entire experiment is measuring this Feynman diagram-like thing we have drawn as our logo. It graphically demonstrates what we're measuring, that is muons interact with a static magnetic field and have a certain reaction strength. If it was just this point, G would be exactly two, and G minus two would be zero, and there wouldn't be much of an experiment. Um, as we know, virtual particles uh, take shortcuts in this interaction, and it's correctly summing up all of the different contributions to the interaction uh, is the theoretical challenge and the experimental, experimental challenge is measuring that effect. So um, I really like experiments where the logo is a summary of the experiment. So you don't have to go back and forth too many times. Um, I wanna emphasize, of course, that this is not my talk, but it's result of uh, well, hundreds of people working for decades um, on, uh, around the globe to, to get this result. And uh, just by the way, one tip, in, in case there are any young researchers out there who haven't yet chosen, um, a collaboration or a career. Not that this is why I joined the experiment, but if you are on an experiment with Italians, well, they have the best collaboration. In my humble opinion. Okay, so it's a measurement 20 years in the making. And in April 7th and 8th of this year, uh, there was the announcement at Fermilab and at CERN more or less coordinated, um, explaining what we saw. Chris Polly gave the results at Fermilab and Graziano uh, gave the results at CERN. Speaking with theorists, Aida and Christoph are two theorists that have been working very closely uh, to come up with the prediction of what we should see. Um, and then at the American Physical Society talks a few weeks later, uh, Thomas, Dave, and Dominic also gave talks. So if you wanna look up more details, you can find their talks. And this number is probably a little bit low. I bet we're up over a hundred seminars now. And indeed some uh, not small amount of public interest. Uh, if you want to really see what we did, not just rely on the story I'm gonna tell you, there are five core papers um, that you should read. 
And I put this one in the so-called kicker paper because this is the component I worked on the most. I'm gonna um, highlight this a little bit because it's what I actually did on the experiment, right? Uh, this first paper is the so-called G minus two theory initiative consensus. That was a few months before we released the result. They came up and said, this is the best value of the calculated uh, value for A sub U that, that we can calculate. Um, this paper overviews the measurement technique is mostly what I'll talk about today. And then there are three basic parts of the experiment that combine measuring the actual precession frequency, measuring how strong the magnetic field is, and then finding out where the beam is since the magnetic field isn't the same everywhere. You gotta find out exactly where the beam is. Um, and then this kicker paper is also out, which describes um, an important part of the apparatus. Uh, we have, the, I think the tracker paper is under review now by the collaboration. And there's plenty of methods and apparatus talks and theses um, on, on the archive. And indeed the proposal stands up as a pretty good document as to what our basic methods are. I think it, not this year, but last year's uh, thesis award at Fermilab was the thesis uh, measuring the muon precession frequency. Okay, so I'll cut to the chase here, let you know what the big deal is. As a function of time, this number has been measured many times. So time goes more or less down here. Um, actually back in 1959, 1960, Leon Letterman made some early measurements, um, but those were like 1% measurements. So the error bars would be huge on this scale. Uh, the scale left and right is just a couple digits out uh, in significant figures. Um, the significant digits. So they're all scaled to be on, the, uh, so they all fall on this plot nicely. And you can see back in the 1979 CERN experiments, there was sort of gross agreement between theory, I'm sorry, theory here on the left, and what, uh, what the experiment measured. Um, and then there was a series of experiments at Brookhaven from 1999 to 2006, where uh, theory had been as uh, improved to this point, right? Which is smaller error bar and lower value. Um, and the experiment started catching up, catching up, catching up, catching up. And it's this difference here, finally published in I think 2006, um, that had a few sigma difference that was the anomaly that people talked about and wondered about, widely cited. And this was the motivation for us to go ahead and move the main storage ring apparatus to Fermilab. Meanwhile, theorists kept calculating, getting better and better error bars, right? Uh, and this is the new number we made. So um, all the work over the past decade um, leads to this one number, um, which when you combine it with this measurement from Brookhaven, yields this result. And if you compare that to the white paper that was published by the Theory Initiative, we conclude with the 4.2 sigma result. I mean, and the exciting thing is the precision of this measure. 0.46 parts per million compares to measuring the length of a football field in your country is football, football or football? 100 yards, right? Um, to 0.46 parts per million, it's like the width of a human hair. So if you're a referee making an offsides call, uh, hopefully they won't ask you to be that sensitive. It's just nice to step back for a second when you ask, why are you, why did it take so long? Uh, because measuring things carefully takes a long time. Okay, so let's stop back for, let's step back for a second and consider why would you bother measuring the magnetic moment of the muon? Or what possible use is it, right? So uh, magnetic moments of particles, if you think back to your uh, field theory, quantum field theory class, um, or you know, re really uh, quantum mechanics class, the Dirac theory, the Dirac equation predicts that the, uh, the magnetic moment of a simple particle, which also called a point particle, is exactly two, right? 
that is the ratio between its magnetic moment, how fast it recesses, and its spin, which is one half in the case of the muon, right? Actually goes with this uh, geometric factor of two, the so-called gyromagnetic ratio. Um, so this would be in casting it in Feynman diagram terms, right? The muon just goes right through, interacts at one point, the strength corresponds to a G factor of two. Life is simple, right? However, quantum corrections predict that in general, the measured gyromagnetic ratio will be not equal to two. And indeed, Schringer was the first to calculate the one loop QED correction, right? And here is the so-called virtual photon, um, taking a shortcut along the way, changing the effective strength all the way along all of the overall reaction and with this value of 00116, which is of course in grade one. So this is a way to probe higher two scales uh, with, with quantum corrections. So how did that work out? Dirac made the prediction that you should get two, right? So let's measure it for a few things, right? Uh, for a proton, um, Otto Stern measured it to be 5.6, right? Now, some of us would say that's a lot, lot different than two. Um, I've had some phenomenologists say, well, six is about equal to two. So on some scales, there's general agreement. A proton is pretty much like a simple particle, kind of more fun, uh, the, great the great measurement of Alvarez, right? And Felix Bloch of, of, of Bloch sphere fame, which we talk about in quantum computing all the time, uh, went ahead and measured it to be negative 1.9. So even though it's neutral, it should have no magnetic moment. Uh, mag yeah, it should have no magnetic moment, but there's a combination of positive and negative forces inside the neutron, which in fact give rise to it spinning backwards, right? Um, this kind of is the first clue to what elementary students, you know, learned that, you know, protons and neutrons aren't point particles. They're made up of quarks and gluons. Right? It's sort of common science sense now to, to people who have, have been indoctrinated in the ways of, of particle physics. Um, the next precise measurement I, was made by Holy and Cush in 1947. I had the great honor to learn e &M from uh, Professor Henry Foley of Columbia University. Right? Now this was of course well after his surprising measurement of G for the electron. And here we're getting closer. And I think people had started to come to terms with the fact that, yeah, the proton and neutron are so heavy, they've got to be made of stuff. But by gum, the electron, if that's not simple, what are we going to do? And it took about a year, six months to a year, um, for Schwinger to do that first calculation of the one loop correction. And there was good agreement, right? So um, this is the first um, success of what turned out to be quantum electrodynamics that immersed in a sort of dynamic sea of virtual particles. Uh, point particles get a little more fuzzy, simple particles get a little more complicated, and that's going to change the G value ever so slightly. So if people say, gee, this, all this stuff with virtual particles you can't see doesn't make sense. Yeah, but you can see an effect. And indeed, the modern agreement between the measurement and prediction of uh, the magnetic moment of the electron um, is outstanding. Um, it's similar to measuring the distance to the moon to an inch and a half or something. And this is a case where the mysterious magnetism is perfectly explained by theoretical calculations. And let me take a side detour to, to just to, to um, I don't know, revel in the glory of that experiment for a minute. I mean, if you write out these digits, uh, it's always fun with uh, when students get an answer on their calculator and give you all the significant digits. You have to explain about significance. But in this case, it really matters. I really like writing these numbers on top of each other, right? And the digits just keep on, you know, getting the same answer all the way out here till about 10 significant digits, right? This is the measure, this is the theoretical calculation of what the magnetic moment of the electron should be. And this is the measurement uh, made by Gabrielesi and others at uh, um, Harvard, who's now doing great stuff at Northwestern now. Um, 
And so of all the Feynman diagrams, they'll make you calculate, right? You got to add them up, right? First of all, you can write down all the diagrams, calculate each one, add them up, right? Put the phases, right? This is just an example of one of the phases. And there is ample homework assignments for graduate students to do to, to check this calculation. Um, in addition to the, you know, the amazement of this calculation and this whole idea that there can be a varying bubbling sea of virtual particles um, is confirmed by the simple measurement. The measurement is its own triumph. You trap electrons and keep them suspended for a month at a time, suddenly changing their energy levels in that penning trap, right? Um, and just, you know, by dint of statistics, coming up with your, um, with the precision that you need to do. So it was in 2008, this measurement was made, 2015. So it's a relatively recent measurement. And if anybody knows of any measurement in physical science, that agrees with a prediction to that precision, I'd love to hear about it. I can't, you know, we have measured other things more carefully, but the agreement between measurement and theory is absolutely Okay, so what's the deal with muons? Chris? Why do so, we like muons so much? Go ahead. Chris, so there's a question. Uh, how do you get uncertainty in the theoretical predictions? Is the upper bound of the contribution of the truncated diagrams or something? Um, it is, to me, one of the great mysteries of life of how theorists assign errors to their calculations. You know, when I do math, I either get the right answer or the wrong answer. Now, some of it is they take um, experimental data into consideration and then use that. Other times, your theories regard, uh, use do Monte Carlo calculations to come up with other effects. Right. Um, but I'm well, I can barely calculate one Schwinger diagram, the Schwinger diagram myself. And I think that was the exact calculation. Um, and the actual guts of what goes on inside of this calculation um, is way beyond my ability to, to, to give you a full appreciation of. Um, it's even more fun when some theoretical calculations give you a statistical and a systematic error bar. Uh, I find that to be even more intriguing. But indeed, their methods of calculations are limited. Um, and I don't think it's just merely truncating at six loops, at five, I'm sorry, at five loops. And if there's a theorist who'd like to correct me on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, and just sort of to presage that, I've got enough trouble figuring out how experimentalists <laughs> come up with their error but that's a topic for later. I hope that addresses the question. I, I think that's great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thanks. Okay, so what's the big deal with muons? Why muons? Well, uh, hopefully you've all seen the standard model of particle physics, right? Here is our periodic table analogy, just like you have for, for the uh, atomic elements. Um, so, you know, normal people just worry about up, up and down quarks and electrons. This makes up the protons and neutrons, and electrons makes all of the elements that we eat and drink every day, right? Um, and there's four force carriers that we deal with. And for the electron, the calculation of that turns out depends mostly on interactions with the photons, quantum electrodynamics, a little bit of a contribution to the weak forces, right? And that's the calculation that was done to 10 sigma three digits. Um, <clears throat> the contributions from the rest of the standard model, in particular the quarks, um, the gluons, right? And well, the strength of the weak forces is stronger too, scales as the mass. And since in the mass of the muon is about 200 times the mass of the electron, um, and it goes as mass squared, this calculation I can do 200 times 200 is 40,000. This is 40,000 times more sensitive to all the so-called hadronic effects, right? So this is why it makes, that's why it makes such a great experimental probe. It is measuring the things we really want to measure. And indeed the, the white paper, you know, pointed out, this is one of the most promising places to look for evidence of new physics. Because we've looked for evidence of new physics in, well, decay rates, um, branching ratios, uh, creation of new particles. And it's kind of hard to see anything new. 
Um, you can argue that neutrino masses are a clue that there's something new going on, but the bread and butter of physics is what are all these strong interactions doing? And this is the most promising place to look for evidence of new physics. Um, of course, the other thing we like about muon is that it's kind of easy to measure this precession, right? And just as the top precesses in a gravitational field and its period of precession, we've all done this homework problem, depends on the strength of G, little g, um, and um, the angular momentum, how fast you're spinning the top. Um, uh, that will uh, tell you, well, measure two of those things, you know what the third one is. So you can use that in any of those three ways. In an analogous way, a spinning charge in a magnetic field will also precess. And that precession frequency depends on how strong is a magnetic field you're applying, right? And how fast is that thing spinning? What's its angular momentum, right? And for our units, um, that's one half of G, right? So analogously, it's the same experiment. If I had one muon, could put it in a magnetic field that was exactly one Tesla, and if I could just watch it precess, measure how fast it's precessing, I do the experiment. Now, of course, you can't do the experiment quite that way. Um, so um, you have to use some very fortuitous properties of muons. It turns out they are also amenable to doing the experiment which is quite convenient, right? Um, this, this cartoon was drawn for the Brookhaven version experiment, but frankly, we haven't been able to draw a better one. So just keep using that one. Here the protons come from Fermilab. You hit a target. Mostly the stuff that comes out anytime you hit protons in the target, you get lots of pions and then a few other things. Um, these pions after a while decay into muons, which lucky for us are pointed with their spin pretty much in the direction of the momentum. I mean, yeah, there's a distribution, but there's a very strong correlation to uh, the direction the muon is going and its spin. And then somehow, I'll tell you that later, you sneak these guys into a storage ring where they go around. The cyclotron frequency makes them go around in a circle, that's easy, right? And then there's a little bit of precession happens too. If G was exactly equal to do to two, the spin would always line up with momentum, but there's a little bit of excess precession. And that's what we're gonna look for. So that's the other reason we really like muons. The first being is I'll go back a, a couple of slides, is they're very sensitive to the rest of this physics. So we can look for new physics beyond the standard model. And the second, they're just gosh darn convenient to make and store in a convenient way. Um, I think if you were to be an extremist, you'd say, oh, great, you've done the electron and muon, now let's measure the magnetic moment at the tau. Uh, and you'll be um, saddened to learn how short this lifetime is. And if you can figure out a way to do that experiment, um, let us know. <laughs> okay, here's a view of what things look like at Fermilab. Uh, the accelerated protons hit the target, oh, so, so we get the recycler, um, and then the protons hit our station here, right? And one advantage we have over Brookhaven is we have this little storage ring, we literally call it the delivery ring. Um, some of you old timers will call it the uh, anti-proton source. It's, the, it's where we would store the anti-protons for the Tevatron, right? Um, but it's been repurposed now to be a delivery, delivery ring. You go around, it depends, three or four times. That gives a chance for most of the pions to decay away. And then you can inject in a pretty pure beam of muons into the uh, accelerate, into our, um, into our experiment, right? Here's another picture. Now looking at the backyard. So, but the buffalo are way out here. This is Wilson Hall. If you look at the backyard of Wilson Hall, here is the anti-proton source. And just to, let me tell a story about John Peoples who built the anti-proton source. After he was director, he loved coming back to visit the lab. He would sit and talk to people. And some of the 
some of the postdocs on G minus two were explaining to this guy, right, what they were doing. And there's this delivery ring with listening. So he was very patiently listening to them and saying, okay, thank you. And after he left, I said, do you know who that was? No, that was John Peoples. Well, what did he do? He built that storage ring you were just talking about, except he called it the anti-proton source. John was very gracious that way to help people. Okay, so anyway, so they came around here, and then uh, this is our experimental hall. So if you ever get to visit Fermilab again, drive around the back and come out and visit us. The other experiment that is coming online is the, is the uh, Mu2E, We're looking for direct conversion of muons to electrons. Um, to an even more rare process. And they're going to be sharing and eventually taking over the muon beam for us. So they're over the bar. And that's the zoom in of where we are. OK, good. OK, so let's do the experiment. The muons come in, right, from the source up there. And this is flipped around backwards from what we were seeing before. Sorry about that. And um, of course, the problem with the magnetic storage ring is if you have a charged particle coming in, as soon as it starts seeing the field, it's gonna bend and hit the wall, right? So you have to drill a hole in your magnet and put in a so-called inflector magnet, which has a magnetic field in the opposite direction. So the muon sees no field until it gets all the way inside of the ring, right? And then it comes out the end of this and says, oh, there's a magnetic field, I'm gonna go around in a circle. So that's how you get uh, the muons into the ring. If that's all you did, they would go around one time and then hit the inject inflector again, and you'd be done, right? So you got to do something else. That's where the kicker comes in. That's the thing I worked on, right? Is um, right after they come in, you have long plates that form an electromagnet and you pulse it with the field that makes sure you do it the right way, um, that reduces the magnetic field so they don't bend as much. And you can see, see here, that's sort of like a hula hoop, changes that red ring around to the green ring. So after getting that kick here, the muons will go around and then miss the inflector and then be on a stable orbit, right? So th this is the voltage as a function of time that we kick with. It takes about 100 microseconds to, um, I'm sorry, 150 nanoseconds where the muons go around one time, right? So while they're going around the first time they get kicked. And uh, I'll just tell you now, the problems we had were a couple. One is the kick wasn't strong enough. And two, it had these after kicks and negative kicks that messed up. With we're sort of fixing those. Today. Okay, now the next problem you have is that if you've got an orbit that's not going exactly straight, if it's going a little bit up, it'll just keep spiraling up and hit the ceiling or spiraling down and hit the floor. So you have to have focusers in there, quadruple fields, the electrostatic fields, quadruples, um, that will, you know, particles that are going up will push down, particles that are too low will push up. So at least you will then have stable orbits. And this gives you the ability to store for you know, thousands of, of orbits long enough before most of the muons decay. Um, the problem is gonna come back and bite you though, is because a relativistic particle going past that electric field will see it as a magnetic field, right? And that will also cause precession. So you're gonna need to know the amplitude of that electric field to the accuracy, you're gonna know the magnetic field and that's really hard to do. So there's a trick we use for that, which I'll show you. Okay. Finally, we've got the muon stored and we wait for them to decay. Uh, lucky for us, right? Muons, not only are they born in a convenient way, but they decay in a convenient way. That is, when I'm a muon and I decay, um, my positron is going to be sent out where the momentum of the positron is correlated with the direction of my spin. So you can ask which way was that muon spin pointing when it decayed by answering the question, which way was the positron? Right. So um, an electron's of less mass, so they'll curl in. So all the way around the inside at 24 stations, in fact, you can see them here, 
Here are the calorimeters that see little tiny showers every time a pause. And if I can figure out how to start this, we'll see a video. And half the time I do this presentation, it works. Half the time it doesn't. Wait. There we go. So this is a video of what immune sees as it goes around the ring. Here's a simulation. So this is oh, rats. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, if you're interested in seeing the video, I'll try and mess with it and make it show up later. Uh, it essentially shows you the computer generated animation we can do because we see where all the material is of the quad plates, of the kicker plates, of the calorimeters, where all of the collimators are. Because obviously when we go back and do the simulations, we do full JON simulations to, right, to simulate what our acceptance is as a function of time and position. Okay, let's move on. As I talked about, um, if Q is exactly equal to two, the momentum and the spin would always be collinear and one, one cyclotron frequency would be one precession frequency and this would be like the moon. You always see the same side of the moon around the earth. Um, what really happens when D is a little bit bigger than two is as you're going, you can see here the spin is pointing a little bit more in. Here the spin's a little bit pointing more in. Here the spin's pointing a little bit more in. And it's precisely this difference in um, the cyclotron and the precession frequency that we measure. And convenience, to make the math work out easier, we use this A as the anomalous magnetic moment, normalizes G minus two over two. That's just gonna make the algebra later. Um, and here's a more detailed look at the process. The red arrow is always the momentum which way the muon is going. Um, see that around the ring, it always points straight ahead. The red is always pointing straight ahead as it goes around the ring. Right? Doesn't look like it here, but, but it is, right? The blue area arrow is the spin direction at each point. So you can see here, they're on top of each other. All you see is the dot of the blue going here. And even after you go a little bit, you see there's a little bit of precession, the blue is pointing a little bit more, a little bit more here a little bit more here, a little bit more here. Then when a muon decays, when a muon decays, wait a second. Ah, yes, when a muon decays, right? In the center of mass, right? The spin, um, parity is conserved. So, um, you know, the positron goes in the direction of the muon spin. Right, where the blue and the red here line up here. Blue being the spin, right? And uh, red being the momentum. Of course, in the center of mass, you have no momentum. By the way, neutrinos go the other way. And yes, this is a wonderful neutrino source, very monochromatic. Um, so you talk to your neutrino friends at Fermilab and do some calculations and realize you'll see like one neutrino event every 10 years in their detectors or some incredibly pathetic small number. So not practical as a neutrino source, but it's monochromatic. Um, if you then boost to the lab frame, it looks like this, right? So this decay, right, happens, let's say it happens here, when the spin was lined up with the momentum. Then you boost that electron, positron well, momentum, it's got a lot of momentum, and it goes and gives you a nice big splat, right, in your calorimeter. Um, we also have tracker chambers to, to calibrate. Um, if it happened here, and you just happen to be in a moment when the, the spin and the momentum were pointing in opposite directions, boy, you're going to not have as much momentum on that positron. It's going to have a lot lower energy. It'll curve faster and, of course, give you less energy in the calorimeter. So that's what you really measure. Now, if you decayed in this position and your spin was pointing in the wrong direction, well, then you would just hit the wall and wouldn't be detected. 
So we don't have 100% acceptance, but these are two examples of events that wind up nicely in our calorimeter coming from two different positions. Um, hopefully that helps describe what we're doing, right? So there are 24 places around the ring where we make that measurement. So there's one calorimeter station and there's the next one. And as we go, as precession happens, right? The spectrum you measure, right? The number of events um, as a function of energy um, changes with a characteristic frequency. And that's the frequency we're looking for. That's the precession frequency we're looking for, right? Um, and one way to think about doing the experiment is to say, well, I'm just gonna put a threshold there, right? And just count the number of events. And as I count those number of events, I'll have more and less and more and less. And there are other ways of doing the analysis. You can ratio what's the number I have to the left and to the right. You can fit the distribution, There's lots of different ways. Um, and indeed the analyses have done it many different ways to get there, right? Okay. So that's how you wind up with what we call the so-called wiggle plot. You see here going left to, left to right, top to bottom, this basic trend is the lifetime of the muon. Right? As you go along, you have fewer and fewer counts. Right? Um, and here, this up and down is the precession. Right? And if this is all we had, you would simply take the Fourier transform of this, find the peak, what that frequency is, and you'd be done, right? And then, since you know the mass of the muon and the strength of the magnetic field, exactly, um, then you would calculate the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Well, um, that's in principle how you could do it, but to get our kind of accuracy, uh, you've got to worry about now all of the fun stuff that you do in the experiment. Uh, first of all, um, well, so this is a reality check. So that, that's the basic strategy of the experiment. I hope that, that works out for you. And now I'm gonna dive into the gory detail. Um, and uh, the first is, of course, we don't know what the magnetic field is. And it's different in different places inside the ring and it changes as a function of time. You know, if someone opens the door and the hall heats up a little bit, the jaws open up a little bit and you change the magnetic field. So you gotta worry about stuff. So, we're constantly monitoring the magnetic field um, using nuclear magnetic resonance with gizmos that look like this. This thing is about 10 inches long, right? And about an inch in diameter. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's an inch in diameter, uh, which we call 25.4 millimeters. Uh, and it's got a sample of um, water in here. And you have a little coil that I can send a pulse through. When I send a pulse through that, it's gonna line up all of the protons to be going sideways, okay? Now, it's sitting in the static magnetic field that we're trying to measure. So those guys are gonna start precessing, right? And they're gonna precess and relax up so that they wind up pointing straight up. So as they, when you hit the pulse, they're precessing with a big signal, and as they're precessing around, you read back on the same coil, they're all radiating like a little antenna radiating, right? Um, except they're all rotating in the same direction there. Um, and so you get a coherent signal out. And if you just zoom in on a little bit of it, you can see this frequency. This is the precession frequency of the proton, which depends on its magnetic moment. And you're gonna ask someone else what that value is. And the strength of the magnetic field. So by monitoring this proton frequency, we're constantly monitoring the magnetic field. Right? That's the basic strategy. And there's an entire paper on the magnetic field. That okay, so we're gonna do two things. We're gonna measure the precession frequency of the muon, and then we're gonna measure what the precession frequency of protons are, where all the, where the, where the tilde, the dash, and the temperature 
um, all relate to things like what is the temperature of the thing? Is this the shielded or unshielded? So we got to get that all straight. But anyway, this is the precession frequency of the muon, the precession frequency of the protons. You notice here now that the magnetic field has dropped out of the equation, right? And you then sort of need to normalize that by a few things. This first factor is the electron G factor in hydrogen divided by the proton G factor. And this is in a sample of water, in a spherical sample of water. Right? I, well, it's the proton to electron. So you work it out that way. Right? So this was measured very carefully back in 1977, which it's a standalone, beautiful experiment all by itself. Um, Nobody's done better since then, so we use this value. And its precision is 10 parts per billion, right? I think this was done in MIT and Stanford. Sorry. Um, and then this number here is from muonium hyperfine splitting. You have to know precisely, like we all say, oh, yeah, the, the, the mass of the muon to the electron is 200. And if you're high, if you're high precision, you say, ah, it's really 211. So 211 or 210, whatever, right? But we need to know that to 22 parts per billion. And it's another beautiful experiment. You make yourself some muonium and get it in the ground state and then do the hyperfine splitting in a strong B field, right? So you can do microwave magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, I think you have to know the magnetic, I forget. No, I think you get from that directly, you get the, 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 the mass ratio of the muon to electron. And that's the most precise measurement of that. Um, getting the magnetic moment of the electron, right, when it's bound to when it's free is an important correction you have to do. And this is a direct calculation. We got the le latest value here from CoData, their publication. Um, then, of course, it all depends on the magnetic moment of the electron, which we already measured in that other experiment, the 10 decimal. So there's yeah, 0 0.2, 0 0.28 parts per trillion. I love quoting that here. Okay. So this is an exact calculation. This is less than a part per trillion. These are a few tens of parts per billion. So all of these external measurements contribute to the error of this ratio a lot less in our measurements. Okay, so what do we do? Um, yeah, so to get this, right, um, you don't just measure this one for one fill and be done, right? You have to repeat this measurement many, many, many times to gather enough statistics for your statistical um, uncertainty to, to get small enough to be worth it, right? And then since you can't always run an experiment the same way all the time, you group together similar run conditions, and then there's a bunch of corrections we know we have to apply, right? Uh, for example, the kicker afterward leaves a little residual field for a fraction of the of the time you're storing the units. Uh, the quads leave a residual field, um, and right, there's, there's there's many other measurements. So you measure these things, and you also have to convolve what the actual magnetic field is as a function of position in the ring and position inside the ring with where the um, muons are, right? So um, that gets you your so-called R value. Uh, the other nice correction you can make is the precession frequency, right? Depends on the electric field you use, and depending on the relativistic boost factor, it has this correction in front of it. This is another fun homework problem to give to graduate students, make an excellent homework problem to do. Um, but anyway, it turns out there's a so-called magic momentum where the nominal value of the anomalous magnetic moment is canceled out exactly when gamma is about 30. So if you have a uh, momentum of about 3 GeV, this correction is greatly canceled out. Then you just have to worry about 
uh, the momentum that is above or below this by a fraction of a percent. So you get a lot more precision by um, going into mag magic momentum. That was the huge enabler for the Brookhaven experiment to be able to do so well. Um, just another you know, fact of life is that things move. And when metal, when, when metal moves in a magnetic field, it induces its own currents, eddy currents, which counteract the magnetic field. Um, so here's an example of the eight pulses that come from the accelerator all at once. Each time you turn down the quad system, so you got less focusing, so the beam will blow up um, and hit collimators and stop. Um, so, so, so you have a nice well-defined beam. And then you turn up the quads to squeeze that into your storage field. And then you do the measure. Well, in the process of doing that, you've induced mechanical vibrations in the field and they'll give you, okay, it's only 400 parts per billion. So it doesn't change it by much, but in the precision game, you got to worry about that. Um, lucky for us, it always caught it going the same way. And this is as we sample the magnetic field during the fill. So as a function of time, you put in a little correction. Um, and that's a small correction with a relatively large error. And this is one of the things we're really working on to measure this study. Um, and then, you know, beam dynamics, you know, the beam moves all over the place. Um, and you have the so-called coherent Betatron oscillation where that hula hoop effect you throw in to kick it it never really settles down. So you see the positron counts are modulated also by these other coherent processes and it gets to be a real mess. Um, you also have lost muons, right? So when they hit a collimator, they're taken out of the sample. Turns out your, your um, probability you'll hit a collimator depends on your momentum, which depends on how much you've processed. So that's gonna bias your effect. So that's another thing. Right. And finally, the phase correction, right? The phase of the muons uh, coming in, I told them they were all lined up exactly, but don't forget uh, the accelerator had to steer the beam to get it to us, right? So when they steered it, they used magnets and that caused a little bit of precession as a function of momentum. So your change in momentum uh, is gonna have a slight phase shift in what's going on. And if you're, you know, lit, let's say linearly losing as a function of frequency, your number of lost muons, that change in phase effectively is a change in your precession frequency. So you got to take that into account too. So all these things are little things you don't worry about when you begin, but when you're getting down to parts per million calculations, um, you got to do it right. Each one of those analyses in the last four slides or so I did, there are at least two PhD theses and years of work going behind each one of those. So that's why it takes so long um, to do this experiment. But anyway, let's, oh, and just one more thing, just to convince you that beam dynamics work. This is one of my favorite pictures. <coughs> this is going through as a function of time of the fill. This is measured of where we saw the K tracks coming from, um, the K vertices coming from based on the tracks in the tracker. And you're going, you know, it's breathing in and out, right? And the magnetic field is not constant across that region. So this is the convolution of the beam position with the actual magnetic field that you've got to get rid of. Okay, so. If you ignore all those features and just take the Fourier transform to look at the frequency, you're completely dominated by these beam dynamic effects. So what you do is you do a 23 parameter fit, which takes all these things into account. Some of them are modeled, some of them are fit by lost V1 data that we see. And one of the parameters coming out of that fit is the frequency you want. And the residual from that is this bottom one where the Fourier transform is dead flat. So it's, you know, you take all the effects into account. Um, the magnetic field changes as a function of time. So every couple of days we stop 
and put in magnetic probes that go around the ring and measure it again. So you got to take that into account. So all the data are corrected over time back to the nominal value of the magnetic field. Um, and the strength of the magnetic field inside depends. So this is the composition. Um, here's the kicker that comes in and puts a current down and it comes back. And the reason it didn't get up to speed is because uh, this is like two kiloamps at 55 kilovolts. Um, and things spark. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And we blew up the cables and didn't get the full strength. We kind of did some provisional rebuilding. It's doing much better now, right? And then measuring that transient field, you put you put a little QGG crystal in here, which respond which changes the polarization of light depending on magnetic field. Very clever way to measure this out, and um, you can actually measure the eddy current left behind by the kicker, and that works out. And there is no significant uh, magnetic distortion left due to the kicker plates themselves. Okay, so bottom line is you have this table of errors, and this is now uh, in our paper, right, publishing the overall thing. This is sort of the shopping list, and this just gives you an idea of what the correction is to um, the, the value of R, right, and this is sort of the uncertainty. So you're changing the central value by a little bit more than a sigma. And so the whole question is, what are the errors? And um, right now we're dominated by statistical errors, which are pretty Gaussian at these statistics. So I can sort of say, okay, these are all Gaussian errors or they're small enough that we don't need to worry about them much more. Um, I hope to have a nice discussion about this later, but what we said is, hey, we know how to combine Gaussian errors and we're dominated by statistics now. So we're just gonna do that because everyone can understand what we did. If you'd like to go back and do something more involved, um, you're more than happy to, to do that. And this is the quick um, reminder of what each problem is. And the biggest ones are the electric field correction, residual from quad focusing, and then really the absolute calibration and where the nuance are is the next one. Other phase except for strength. Yeah, so there's a lot of places to, to do work. And this is what's going on in run two and three. Um, anyway, you have, do all the math, do the combinations, and this is a zoom in on um, the results. And here I've given you, this is the anomalous magnetic movement times 10 to the ninth minus this integer to give you the significant digits where it matters. So you can see we're a couple of these units away. Um, and that's 4.2 sigma. This is the theory that you did. This is us. It's amusing to see that although our error bars got smaller than Brookhaven because of slightly better statistics, um, the mean value went down, which is... Okay, so what does it all mean? Um, Raise your hand if you don't know who Mark Hamill is. I think you may proceed. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, so the big conclusions, what are we to make of all this? First of all, the G minus two experiment works at Fermi, right? All the systems coming together, the darn thing works reliably. So that's the huge news. Give us more muons. That's exactly what's happening. Um, we're going to increase the statistics by something like a factor of 16. Um, of course, that depends on lots of things, but I chose to quote 16 because I can take the square root of 16, and that's four. So the error bar, the statistical error bar, should get something like four times smaller, right? And we're working on the systematics. Um, this first run, since we're under kicking, a lot of the systematic effects were worse. Now that we're centering the beam where the magnetic field variation is more gentle, it's not going to be as bad, right? Um, the two, in fact, the two challenges, non-centered beam and the quad focusing being not quite as good as it could be, really tested them, right? Um, and probably um, the, the biggest sigh of relief I heard was from the people who on both experiments that there's 
we saw nothing that they did wrong, right? Um, anything worth, there's nothing worth changing in the work they did. Okay. Um, so now we enter the realm of pure speculation. Um, when two numbers that, so, you know, in a certain sense, I should formally stop the talk here. This I'm, this is all solid ground, but what fun is that? Let's speculate, right? Um, when two numbers don't match, you know, either the first number is wrong, the second number is wrong, or you're thinking it's wrong, right? So to fix the first number being wrong, it could be we have unlucky statistics, right? Um, or some extremely subtle systematics, or, you know, just plain old mistakes, right? So we're going to keep running G minus two. It's a collaboration of young, smart people that are working hard to find mistakes, good for them. And J Park is running a completely independent experiment. I'll show you a picture of that later. You got to repeat the experiment, right? Um, more fun for me to think about is because it's someone else's problem is that there's a problem with the, the, the theory, right? I mean, hydronic calculations are notorious to me. Um, there are lattice QCD calculations coming out, which are giving what they claim to be are different values than the other theory, which is more in agreement with, with experiment. Um, that's extremely active right now. But you know, the good news is there's motivation for more theoretical work. And some of the terms in the theoretical calculations are what they call data-based calculations, which means rather than calculating, you're taking some of the form factors from scattering experiments. So redoing those experiments, in fact, there's a CERN collaboration that's prototyping now mu on E that's going to go do those measurements better. Now, of course, the fun thing to think about is that, oh, we found something wrong with the standard model. Yippee, right? Um, there's a new particle. There's a new force. I still think the most sober uh, description of the state of play is Dominic's paper he wrote now back in April, I think, right? where he points out that, hey, you know, there's still plenty of room for supersymmetry. Before, go ahead and speculate what you want, but kind of normal beyond standard model physics, there's still plenty of room for that. Um, but, you know, if you want to um, go crazy, you talk about leptoquarks or say that there's combination, there's some correlation with LHCB, their muon electron anomaly is a few sigma, right? The CKM matrix is not quite unitary, and it should be. Uh, you've got dark matter, you've got the fifth, fourth. Put your favorite speculation in there, read the archive and have fun. Okay, here's the J Park experiment. They do basically the same thing, except their storage area is one big empty evacuated surface uh, area, volume, where they allow the muons to precess, and they've got a 3D view of all the decay. That's a lot less systematics, uh, but the problem is getting the flux ion. And the muon E experiment is here. They've got, you know, it's not, if you want to join a new experiment, um, join it. Plus, it's working with Italians. So you get to have good collaboration. Um, there were, there's all sorts of talk at Fermilab what to do with the ring. Should we run U? Plus? Uh, should we do precision decays to measure the mass of the neutrino directly? So let me end and just point out that all these clever people are working hard to reduce the data for runs two and three right now. Uh, we have run four is already taken, run five, six are signing up now. And by the end of all that, uh, we should have about a quarter of the size of the error bars and we'll let you know what we see when we see it. All right, thank you very much, Chris. And um, you're very welcome of, on behalf of everybody. Uh, so, um, yeah, sorry, I went a little long here. Sorry about that. <laughs>